Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. Plato's Dialogue, Gorgias, Part 13 Only I should like further to know whether the Athenians are supposed to have been made better by Pericles, or, on the contrary, to have been corrupted by him. For I hear that he was the first who gave the people pay, and made them idle and cowardly, and encouraged them in the love of talk and money. You heard that, Socrates, from the laconizing set who bruise their ears. But what I am going to tell you now is not mere hearsay, but well known both to you and me. That at first Pericles was glorious and his character unimpeached by any verdict of the Athenians. This was during the time when they were not so good. Yet afterwards, when they had been made good and gentle by him, at the very end of his life, they convicted him of theft and almost put him to death, clearly under the notion that he was a malefactor. Well, but how does that prove Pericles' badness? Why, surely you would say that he was a bad manager of asses or horses or oxen, who has received them originally neither kicking nor butting nor biting him, and implanted in them all these savage tricks? Would he not be a bad manager of any animals who received them gentle, and made them fiercer than they were when he received them? What do you say? I will do you the favor of saying yes. And will you also do me the favor of saying whether man is an animal? Certainly he is. And was not Pericles a shepherd of men? Yes. And if he was a good political shepherd, ought not the animals who were his subjects, as we were just now acknowledging, to have become more just and not more unjust? Quite true. And are not just men gentle, as Homer says? Or are you of another mind? I agree. And yet he really did make them more savage than he received them. And their savageness was shown towards himself, which he must have been very far from desiring. Do you want me to agree with you? Yes, if I seem to you to speak the truth. Granted, then. And if they were more savage, must they not have been more unjust and inferior? Granted again. Then upon this view, Pericles was not a good statesman? That is, upon your view. Nay, the view is yours, after what you have admitted. Take the case of Cimon again. Did not the very persons whom he was serving ostracize him, in order that they might not hear his voice for ten years? And they did just the same to Themistocles, adding the penalty of exile. And they voted that Miltiades, the hero of Marathon, should be thrown into the pit of death, and he was only saved by the Pratanus. And yet, if they had been really good men, as you say, these things would never have happened to them. For the good charioteers are not those who at first keep their place, and then, when they have broken in their horses, and themselves become better charioteers, are thrown out. That is not the way either in charioteering, or in any profession. What do you think? I should think not. Well, but if so, the truth is as I have already said, that in the Athenian state no one has ever shown himself to be a good statesman. You admitted that this was true of our present statesmen, but not true of former ones, and you preferred them to the others. Yet they have turned out to be no better than our present ones, and therefore, if they were rhetoricians, they did not use the true art of rhetoric or of flattery, or they would not have fallen out of favor. But surely, Socrates, no living man ever came near any one of them in his performances. Oh, my dear friend, I say nothing against them regarded as the serving men of the state, and I do think that they were certainly more serviceable than those who are living now, and better able to gratify the wishes of the state. But as to transforming those desires and not allowing them to have their way, and using the powers which they had, whether of persuasion or of force, in the improvement of their fellow citizens, which is the prime object of the truly good citizen, 
I do not see that in these respects they were a whit superior to our present statesmen, although I do admit that they were more clever at providing ships and walls and docks and all that. You and I have a ridiculous way, for during the whole time that we are arguing, we are always going round and round to the same point, and constantly misunderstanding one another. If I am not mistaken, you have admitted and acknowledged more than once that there are two kinds of operations which have to do with the body, and two which have to do with the soul. One of the two is ministerial, and if our bodies are hungry provides food for them, and if they are thirsty gives them drink, or if they are cold supplies them with garments, blankets, shoes, and all that they crave. I use the same images as before intentionally in order that you may understand me the better. The purveyor of the articles may provide them either wholesale or retail, or he may be the maker of any of them. The baker, or the cook, or the weaver, or the shoemaker, or the courier. And in so doing, being such as he is, he is naturally supposed by himself and everyone to minister to the body. But none of them know that there is another art an art of gymnastic and medicine, which is the true minister of the body, and ought to be the mistress of all the rest, and to use their results according to the knowledge which she has, and they have not, of the real good or bad effects of meats and drinks on the body. All other arts which have to do with the body are servile and menial and illiberal, and gymnastic and medicine are, as they ought to be, their mistresses. Now, when I say that all this is equally true of the soul, you seem at first to know and understand and assent to my words, and then a little while afterwards you come repeating, Has not the state had good and noble citizens? And when I ask you who they are, you reply, seemingly quite in earnest, as if I had asked who are or have been good trainers. And you had replied, Therion the baker, Mithoecus, who wrote the Sicilian cookery book, Sorambus the vintner. These are ministers of the body, first rate in their art. For the first makes admirable loaves, the second excellent dishes, and the third capital wine. To me, these appear to be the exact parallel of the statesmen whom you mention. Now you would not be altogether pleased if I said to you, My friend, you know nothing of gymnastics. Those of whom you are speaking to me are only the ministers and purveyors of luxury, who have no good or noble notions of their art, and may very likely be filling and fattening men's bodies and gaining their approval, although the result is that they lose their original flesh in the long run, and become thinner than they were before. And yet they, in their simplicity, will not attribute their diseases and loss of flesh to their entertainers. But when in after years the unhealthy surfeit brings the attendant penalty of disease, he who happens to be near them at the time and offers them advice is accused and blamed by them, and if they could, they would do him some harm, while they proceed to eulogize the men who have been the real authors of the mischief. And that, Callicles, is just what you are now doing. You praise the men who feasted the citizens and satisfied their desires and people say that they have made the city great, not seeing that the swollen and ulcerated condition of the state is to be attributed to these elder statesmen, for they have filled the city full of harbors and docks and walls and revenues and all that, and have left no room for justice and temperance. And when the crisis of the disorder comes, the people will blame the advisers of the hour, and applaud Themistocles and Cimon and Pericles, who are the real authors of their calamities. And if you are not careful, they may assail you and my friend Alcibiades when they are losing not only their new acquisitions, but also their original possessions. Not that you are the authors of these misfortunes of theirs, although you may perhaps be accessories to them. A great piece of work is always being made, as I see and am told, now as of old, about our statesmen. When the state treats any of them as malefactors, I observe that there is a great uproar and indignation at the supposed wrong which is done to them. Quote, 
after all their many services to the state, that they should unjustly perish. So the tale runs. But the cry is all a lie, for no statesman ever could be unjustly put to death by the city of which he is the head. The case of the professed statesman is, I believe, very much like that of the professed sophist. For the sophists, although they are wise men, are nevertheless guilty of a strange piece of folly. Professing to be teachers of virtue, they will often accuse their disciples of wronging them and defrauding them of their pay, and showing no gratitude for their services. Yet what can be more absurd than that men who have become just and good, and whose injustice has been taken away from them, and who have had justice implanted in them by their teachers, should act unjustly by reason of the injustice which is not in them. Can anything be more irrational, my friends, than this? You, Callicles, compel me to be a mob orator, because you will not answer. And you are the man who cannot speak unless there is someone to answer? I suppose that I can. Just now, at any rate, the speeches which I am making are long enough because you refuse to answer me. But I adjure you by the God of friendship, my good sir. Do tell me whether there does not appear to you to be a great inconsistency in saying that you have made a man good and then blaming him for being bad. Yes, it appears so to me. Do you never hear our professors of education speaking in this inconsistent manner? Yes, but why talk of men who are good for nothing? I would rather say, why talk of men who profess to be rulers? and declare that they are devoted to the improvement of the city, and nevertheless upon occasion declaim against the utter vileness of the city. Do you think that there is any difference between one and the other? My good friend, the sophist and the rhetorician, as I was saying to Polus, are the same or nearly the same. But you ignorantly fancy that rhetoric is a perfect thing, and sophistry a thing to be despised. Whereas the truth is that sophistry is as much superior to rhetoric as legislation is to the practice of law, or gymnastic to medicine. The orators and sophists, as I am inclined to think, are the only class who cannot complain of the mischief ensuing to themselves from that which they teach others, without in the same breath accusing themselves of having done no good to those whom they profess to benefit. Is not this a fact? Certainly it is. If they were right in saying that they make men better, then they are the only class who can afford to leave their remuneration to those who have been benefited by them. Whereas if a man has been benefited in any other way, if, for example, he has been taught to run by a trainer, he might possibly defraud him of his pay if the trainer left the matter to him and made no agreement with him that he should receive money as soon as he had given him the utmost speed. For not because of any deficiency of speed do men act unjustly, but by reason of injustice. Very true. And he who removes injustice can be in no danger of being treated unjustly. He alone can safely leave the honorarium to his pupils, if he be really able to make them good. Am I not right? Yes. Then we have found the reason why there is no dishonor in a man receiving pay who is called in to advise about building or any other art? Yes, we have found the reason. But when the point is how a man may become best himself and best govern his family and state, then to say that you will give no advice gratis is held to be dishonorable? True. And why? because only such benefits call forth a desire to requite them, and there is evidence that a benefit has been conferred when the benefactor receives a return. Otherwise not. Is this true? It is. Then to which service of the state do you invite me? Determine for me. Am I to be the physician of the state who will strive and struggle to make the Athenians as good as possible? Or am I to be the servant and flatterer of the state? Speak out, my good friend, freely and fairly, as you did at first, and ought to do again, 
and tell me your entire mind. I say then that you should be the servant of the state. The flatterer? Well, sir, that is a noble invitation. The Mesian, Socrates, or what you please, for if you refuse, the consequences will be, do not repeat the old story, that he who likes will kill me and get my money, for then I shall have to repeat the old answer, that he will be a bad man and will kill the good, and that the money will be of no use to him, but that he will wrongly use that which he wrongly took, and if wrongly, basely, and if basely, hurtfully. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be, and when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right.